Dana Miller presents the ninth annual Obesity Conference, a practical look at obesity, diabetes, and current strategies. Featuring Scott Konoski, Ph.D., GLP-1, and the CNS Regulation of Appetite. All right, good morning. Welcome back. Um, amazing to see so many bright-eyed people ready to go and looking forward to another day. Um, and uh, our, our first speaker of the morning is Dr. Uh, Scott Konoski, um, and we're going to introduce um, a little bit of real-world real uh, science, um, which I think will really tie into some of the clinical things we were talking about yesterday. So Dr. Konoski's uh, research focuses on the neurobiological control of food intake and body weight regulation. His laboratory focuses on understanding how the brain processes peripherally and centrally derived hormonal signals to control learned and motivated aspects of feeding behavior, uh, as well as to examine how these neuroendocrine signaling systems contribute to and are compromised by obesity and, and related metabolic disorders. So, um, and your professor, I believe, uh, uh, he's a pre professor of biological sciences at the University of Southern California. Please well, uh, welcome Dr. Konoski. So thank you again. Thank you for the introduction. I want to thank the organizers for, for giving me the opportunity to participate in this. This has been a lot of fun for me. I used to live in Philadelphia, so it's great to be back in Philly with such beautiful fall weather. And it's also been a very unique experience for me at this meeting. As, as mentioned, I'm a, a pure basic science researcher, so I'm a bit of a lone wolf in this room. Uh, but it's been a great experience for me to interact with those of you that are really on the front lines of obesity treatment and research. I go to the Obesity Society meeting Every year is coming up in about a week in Nashville. I don't know if any of you go. No? Uh, it's a good mix of clinicians and surgeons and, and basic science researchers. But what tends to happen at this meeting is people just gravitate within their own circles. Uh, so it's really been a nice experience for me here to, to interact with you. As was mentioned in my introduction, I'm a behavioral neuroscientist. So I'm a basic science researcher, and the goal of my laboratory's research program is to try to understand how the brain controls food intake and, to a lesser extent, body weight regulation. But I'm more interested in the feeding side of the energy balance equation. And in my area of research, there has historically been two primary, quote, feeding centers in the brain, uh, one of which was discussed yesterday. That's the hypothalamus. And we've known for decades that if you do discrete lesions to different subnuclei within the hypothalamus, you get a profound effect on food intake and body weight phenotypes in animal models. And more recently, in the past 15, 20 years, we've really honed in on a specific set of neurons. These are the, uh, the AGRP and POMC neurons that are located within the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus. These neurons respond differentially to leptin to regulate not just food intake, but energy expenditure and, and overall energy balance. The second primary feeding center in the brain is the dorsal medulla, or the caudal brainstem. And perhaps the most dramatic illustration of how important the brainstem is for meal size control comes from classic decerebrate rat studies. So this is a rat that has a transection at the level of the midbrain. Uh, basically, this animal only has a hindbrain and, and part of a midbrain. So you can imagine this is not a happy animal. Uh, in fact, you have to tube feed this animal to keep it alive. But what is very interesting about the decerebrate rat is with orally infused nutrients, they show a relatively normal satiation response. So when they become full, they'll start to reject those orally infused nutrients to the same magnitude that a control normal animal would. And that's just a really dramatic illustration of how important the brainstem alone is for meal size control. One of the problems in our field is that we've been not exclusively, but almost exclusively focusing on these hypothalamic and, and brainstem circuits and how they regulate energy balance. Uh, but energy balance is very complicated, and food intake is a very complicated behavior. And really what these lower order hypothalamic and hindbrain circuits are thought to be regulating is more of the homeostatic regulation of energy balance, akin to, to a thermostat self-regulating the temperature in the room. But as I mentioned, food intake is very complex. We don't passively respond to food cues and, and consume food until we become energy replete. Uh, but rather, food intake for both low, lower order mammals and, and for humans is a very complex decision making process. We have to decide what we're going to eat. We have to find the food, who we're going to eat with, how much we're going to eat. And because it's such a complex behavior, 
feeding must undoubtedly engage higher order neural substrates. So it can't just be these, these basic lower order hindbrain and hypothalamic substrates purely controlling food intake. And really what we need to try to study in the brain is the brain regions that help us deal with this challenge of the, quote, obesogenic environment. And I personally live in, in the absolute epicenter of the obesogenic environment. I live in the city of Los Angeles, and California is not the most obese state. Los Angeles is not necessarily the most obese city. Uh, but where I live, it's, it's truly at the epicenter of, of the obesogenic environment. So I'm walking to my car after work. I walk by three or four vending machines, and you can see the food in them is not exactly healthy. There's a picture of the actual vending machine. Uh, get in my car and I drive home. It's a relatively short commute in Los Angeles. And that picture you see there is, is a picture taken in the neighborhood where I work. The University of Southern California is near downtown LA. And what's interesting is I didn't take that picture. If you Google obesogenic environment, that's one of the, the first pictures that comes up on the search. Uh, it's just an example of, of me really being in the, in the trenches of, of this environment. And then I drive home. In a 15-minute drive, I counted 23 fast food restaurants that I drive by, which is quite a bit, including a church's chicken across the street from a KFC. Um, but I think recently the KFC is now a, a Starbucks. I'm not sure if that's any better or worse. And these are some of the main brain regions that help us deal with the obesogenic environment. This is the, the, the reward circuitry in the brain is a term that's often used in our field. And you can see some of the acronyms on there stand for the, the prefrontal cortex, the hippocampus. We have the, the dopamine pathway from the ventral tegmental area in the midbrain projecting to the nucleus accumbens. And these are brain regions that are, are really important for reward and, and cognitive and learned aspects of feeding, some of the more complex processes that influence what we eat as opposed to just correcting an energy depletion. And in the past 10 to 12 years, there's been a renaissance in our field in terms of appreciating these, these higher order reward substrates in the brain and how they influence feeding behavior. And we've learned from a series of papers over the last few years that the classic feeding signals, uh, some of which come from the periphery, GLP-1, leptin, and ghrelin, act in the brain's reward circuitry to not just influence basic food intake, but to influence these more complex aspects uh, of feeding, uh, more specifically dealing with, with food reward and the challenge of, of being faced with an obesogenic environment. And this is a list of some of the classic feeding signals that act in the brain to potently influence food intake and, and body weight regulation. And spoiler alert from my title, you can probably guess which one I'm going to be focusing on today exclusively. And that is glucagon-like peptide 1. And I'm sure a lot of you know that GLP-1 is clinically relevant, of course. Um, but I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of the GLP-1 physiologies so we have a little bit of a background on the system aside from its, its clinical relevance. And then after that overview, I'll get back into the, the brain's reward circuitry. GLP-1 is produced in the distal small intestines, in the ileal L cells. It's most famously known as an incretin hormone. It stimulates the glucose-dependent release of insulin from the pancreas to aid in both digestion and, and blood glucose regulation. It also inhibits gastric and intestinal emptying and produces satiation and satiety to reduce food intake, these, these latter two, which are very much related. And that's the focus of my interest in, in GLP-1 is not its incretin effects, uh, but its hypophagic effects. It is secreted from these L cells in what I call a triphasic manner. Uh, a lesser known secretion mechanism is that it's actually released based on conditioning, based on the anticipation of feeding. So there is a cephalic GLP-1 release that a lot of people don't, don't know about or think about. There's also an early phase release of GLP-1 from the L cells. When you have nutrient contacts with the, the stomach and the upper intestines, this is a neurally mediated response. So the nutrients are not yet arriving to the distal intestines where the GLP-1 secreting cells are located. But when nutrients do get there, that's considered the late phase, the, the direct release of, of GLP-1. And one thing I want to point out about this peripheral GLP-1 physiology is the vagus nerve is very important. So GLP-1 is communicating to the vagus nerve. And the nutrients that, that lead to this uh, second early phase neurally mediated release of GLP-1 is based on communication with the vagus nerve, as is the communication from GLP-1 release during the late phase as well. So the vagus nerve is, is very important for GLP-1 physiology. 
This is, of course, the, the tenth cranial nerve. It's a very important nerve with regards to gut-brain communications. It's considered to be the primary conduit of communication between the gut and the brain. Perhaps lesser known in this audience is that GLP-1 is not only secreted from these peripheral intestine cells, but there's also a population of neurons in the brain that produce GLP-1. These are known as the pre-proglucagon expressing neurons. They're located exclusively in the caudal brainstem, more specifically in the nucleus tractus solitarius, which coincidentally is the first site in the brain to receive vagally mediated signaling coming from the gut. And my primary model organism is the rat, so I'll be showing you a few rat brain images and cartoons throughout my presentation. This is a sagittal cartoon image of a, a rat's brain. And the, let's see if this works. That circle there is where these GLP-1 producing neurons are located in a rat's brain. So this is the very rear of the brain. This is right where the, the spinal cord is transitioning into to become the brain stem. The brain is a, a beautiful place to work. Um, one of the favorite aspects of my job is I get to play with microscopes and, and generate pretty photomicrographs like this one. Uh, it's somewhat of an art, I'd like to think. And, and this particular work of art is showing you the GLP-1 producing neurons in a rat's brain. Uh, so of course they're not red under normal conditions, but we've immunostained them with, with fluorescent antibodies so that we can see them stand out among the, the sea of other neurons. So these are the GLP-1 producing neurons depicted here. Again, only existing in the caudal brainstem. And you can see these little lines coming from them. These are the axons of the GLP-1 neurons. And what's interesting about these neurons is that they project throughout the entire brain. So when we think about neural communication, you think of the little picture of a neuron in the textbook, and you have this little dendrite and this little axon, and it's communicating with, with an adjacent cell nearby. Of course, that does happen, uh, but there's a lot of neurons called projection neurons that have very long, extensive axonal projections. The GLP-1 neurons are indeed projection neurons. So their axons project literally throughout the entire brain. So you can have one neuron sitting back here in the hindbrain whose axons will project all the way to the, to the rostral extent of the brain. So really quite unique neurons. And they do it indeed project throughout the brain. And consistent with that, the receptor for GLP-1 is expressed throughout the brain as well. If you activate the receptors for GLP-1 in the brain, you get a, a variety of, of effects, including but not limited to, there's neuroprotective effects of GLP-1. So there's some interest in this system for potential uh, Alzheimer's therapy. Uh, you also get a visceral stress response by activating certain populations of these neurons and a reduction in food intake as well, these latter two which, which may or may not be related. One thing I want to point out that's important about the central GLP-1 system is that the, the zeitgeist of thought in GLP-1 physiology is that GLP-1 signaling in the brain is coming exclusively from these GLP-1 producing neurons. So we know that the peripheral release GLP-1 is a very rapid half-life about 90 seconds before it's chewed up by DPP-4 in the periphery. And there's some evidence to suggest that there's not a strong presence of peripherally derived GLP-1 in the brain. That really what's going on in the brain is, is coming from these GLP-1 producing neurons that are exclusively located in the, the caudal brainstem. <coughs> so just a, a summary of the overview of GLP-1 physiology, we really have two different worlds here. So we have this peripheral GLP-1 system that's important for incretin effects and for satiety as well, and this is very much communicating to the vagus nerve. And then we have this separate world of GLP-1 in the brain. So we have these neurons in the hindbrain that extensively project throughout the brain that increase uh, satiety and reduce food intake. <coughs> and of course, all of you know that GLP-1 is, is perhaps the most clinically relevant uh, endocrine and neuropeptide system for obesity treatment today. And we know that there are GLP-1 analogs to, to target this system, one of the earlier of which is Xenin-4, or Xanatide, which was originally derived from the venomous saliva of the Hilla monster, pictured there. And of course, we have Liraglutide, or Liraglutide, as they say in Denmark. I'm not sure what's the correct pronunciation. Um, I say Liraglutide. 
And this is, of course, another long-acting GLP-1 analog. It's got a half-life of about 13 hours, administered once daily, as, as almost all of you are aware of. Uh, initially, this was under the trade name Victoza for type 2 diabetes treatments. And then a few years ago, of course, it was approved by the FDA, same drug, higher dose for, for weight loss or obesity treatment under the name Saxendo. And this is, uh, you might have seen the commercials for this one, and some of you might work with, with this with your patients. This is Ozempic. Uh, it's a once-weekly GLP-1 analog that is not FDA approved for weight loss, but is uh, FDA approved for type 2 diabetes treatment. So perhaps we'll have uh, once-weekly administration GLP-1 analogs for weight loss in the not-too-distant future. I don't want to sound selfish in that I'm not interested in clinical therapy for obesity, but as a basic science researcher, what I really am interested in is understanding how these systems work, putting these puzzle pieces together. And about eight years ago, some of my close colleagues and I were really interested in understanding what are the biological mechanisms through which these long-acting GLP-1 analogs reduce food intake. And we had this thought that, based on the extended half-life of these GLP-1 analogs, that perhaps it's, it's not as simple as this peripheral GLP-1 system and or this, this brain GLP-1 system, but there may be some crosstalk between the periphery and the brain with regards to these long-acting GLP-1 analogs. So we know that extended 4 and raglatide, for example, can cross the blood-brain barrier. So they can get into the brain. And so can GLP-1, but again, the half-life of GLP-1 is so short that it's not considered to be uh, feasible that it is getting to the brain in meaningful concentrations. But that may be a different story with these analogs. And if they do have access to the brain and they have a longer half-life, they could be acting directly on GLP-1 receptors expressed in the brain. If so, that would mean that the brain's GLP-1 system is not just this interesting system to play with for basic science research, but may also have some clinical relevance to try to understand what's going on with GLP-1 receptor in the brain. So to ask this question, we started with a surgical approach. This is a very complicated surgical approach in, in rats to selectively lesion the vagal afferent or sensory input to the brain while preserving most of the vagal efferent or motor signaling from the brain. And this is a surgery I'm not good enough to do. I'm a decent rat surgeon, uh, but this one is so challenging. There's literally three or four people in the world that can reliably do this. Uh, the first part's easy. You just lesion unilaterally the, the whole trunk of the vagus below the diaphragm. Uh, but down here, the, the sensory motor fibers are bundled together, and you can't separate them. So to selectively get the afferents for the other branch, you go in through the neck. And uh, this is where it gets very challenging. But you can actually find where the vagus nerve goes into the hindbrain. And a, a more skilled surgeon than I can selectively pull out the sensory rootlets. And essentially what you have with this surgical approach is an animal that has all of the gastrointestinal vagal sensory signaling eliminated, but has preserved 50% of the efferent motor signaling, which is important because 50% is enough for the animals to be relatively normal. So they have normal gastric emptying, uh, can be maintained on a normal solid diet. Total vagotomy animals have to be maintained on, on a liquid diet. And this is the best method for selective vagal deafferentation. So I mentioned I, I can't do these surgeries. I, I did one or two, but it took me six or seven hours, and it wasn't going to happen. So we, we called on someone who could do them, uh, collaborated with, with Mirta Arnold and Wolfgang Longhans at ETH Zurich. And, and they helped us generate a, a few cohorts of these animals that have this very selective vagal deafferentation. The tricky part was getting the animals. Uh, after that, the experimental design was relatively basic. So we injected GLP-1 analogs into the periphery in these animals and looked at their food intake. So these are non-restricted animals just free feeding in the home cage. And there's a lot going on in this, this picture here, but I'll try to walk you through it. So if you look at the control animals, we have different doses of loraglutide and extendin-4. And this is cumulative food intake six hours and 24 hours after a single peripheral, uh, this was interperitoneal injection. And you can see that with loraglutide and extendin-4, the controls are consuming less food. Not surprising. Uh, what was more interesting was what happened with these animals that had the selective uh, vagal deafferentation. And we are still seeing a pretty potent reduction in food intake, even though all of the vagal sensory signaling has been eliminated in these animals. I'll 
I should point out that it is attenuated, right? So if you look at the lower dose, they were effective for both drugs in reducing food intake for the controls, but not in these, these SDA, vagal deafferent uh, ablated animals. Uh, but that said, the, the medium and higher doses were effective, and we're still seeing a very potent reduction in food intake. So what this told us is that the vagus may be partially involved in the food intake reducing effects of GLP-1 analogs, but it's certainly not the whole story. And, and it suggests that it may be acting directly in the brain. And to get at that question more directly, we utilize another approach. So these are normal animals, and they're given an injection of a GLP-1 analog in the periphery. And the same animals are given an injection of a GLP-1 receptor antagonist directly into the brain. So we inject this into the uh, cerebral ventricular system, which is sort of a general brain delivery mechanism for, for rodent neuropharmacology. And here's the, the food intake results following that combined injection procedure. And if you look at this and this here and this as well, what that's showing is when we combine the two, when we have the peripheral GLP-1 analog combined with the, the central administration of a GLP-1 receptor antagonist, we get an attenuation, and in this case with extended for a complete elimination of that food intake reduction. So this is just further evidence that these GLP-1 analogs are indeed getting into the brain, and further, that a lot of the, the food intake reducing effects produced by these analogs involves direct brain GLP-1 receptor activation. To summarize these studies, we showed that the FDA-approved long-acting analogs reduce food intake and body weight in part via a vagal independent uh, brain direct mechanism. And these findings were replicated by a few groups, uh, by Randy Seeley's group, who's now at, at Michigan, University of Michigan, and also from a group uh, at Novo Nordisk, uh, who replicated and extended these findings. So it's now widely accepted that these GLP-1 analogs are indeed acting on the brain and that the food intake reducing effects are largely mediated by that. So that's food intake, um, but as almost all of you are aware, there's a, there's a negative side, there's a dark side to GLP-1 analog therapy, and that is, um, while of course these drugs are, are very well tolerated and present negligible risks of life-threatening adverse events, there are negative unwanted side effects. And for GLP-1, the most common side effect for GLP-1 analogs is nausea and in some cases vomiting. It's a bit more common with exanatide than with araglutide. And in some cases, this can lead to discontinuation of drug treatment and reduced uh, dose tolerance. So we were interested in trying to look at, before I was focusing on the biological mechanisms through which GLP-1 analogs reduce food intake, now we're interested in looking at the, the nausea effects. And the pipe dream would be if we could potentially find two different pathways in which you could separate and target the food intake reducing effects independent of the nausea producing effects. So our question is what are the biological mechanisms underlying nausea from GLP-1 analogs? In rats and mice, they're, they're non-vomiting species. They lack the, the physiology for emesis. Uh, we can't ask them how they feel. We, we can, but it's not going to be a very interesting response. Uh, but we, we do have some tools for trying to get at, at nausea mechanisms in rodents. And this is one that's, that's pretty established. It's called pica, the phenomenon of ingesting non neuterb substances. And this isn't unique to, to rodents. Dogs do this as well. I had a, a dog that, that did this a lot before she, she died. She was having some gastrointestinal issues. Uh, some humans do this as well. It's common in pregnancy. And in rats, the model is that they will consume kale and clay. And this is a well-established quantitative measure of nausea. So it's been correlated with, with other nausea outputs and, and agents. <coughs> and we asked whether the GLP-1 receptor agonist require the vagus nerve for the nausea effects that, that are unfortunately accompanied by GLP-1 agonist treatment. So we have this, this vagal deafferentation approach again. And we're simply injecting, in this case, it was extendin 4, and it was chronic treatment. So we were giving it uh, subcutaneously twice a day to match human clinical treatment for exanatide. And in the control animals, you can see that under vehicle conditions, they don't eat that clay at all. They play with it a little bit, they, they chew it up, and then just drop it into the bedding. They don't actually eat it. Uh, when animals are ill or nausea, experiencing nausea, they will consume the clay, and this is showing you the intake of the extended 4 treated animals of that kale and clay. 
What was quite interesting is in the animals with the vagal deafferentation, we still see that, that pica response. And in fact, it's, it's somewhat enhanced compared to the control animals. So this is pretty dramatic evidence that the nausea that is produced or accompanied by GLP-1 analogs is not mediated by vagus nerve communication, which again, the peripheral GLP-1 effects are thought to be almost predominantly mediated by the vagus nerve. It uh, does not seem to be the case for either the food intake reduction or the, the nausea accompanying extended foreign liragotide. So we got at this with, with the parallel strategy that I presented earlier, where we did a combined administration of extended four in the periphery with a brain injection of a GLP-1 receptor antagonist, extended 939 is a selective GLP-1 receptor antagonist. And as you can see here, the combined treatment attenuated the pica response. So this suggests that the nausea accompanying GLP-1 analog treatment is also involving a direct GLP-1 receptor action in the brain similar to the, the food intake reducing effects from the previous set of studies. So this tells us again that understanding the GLP-1 brain signaling system has clinical relevance because that's really how these, these analogs are acting predominantly is, is through blood-brain barrier penetration and action in the brain. And now I'm gonna get back to the brain. So we know that the brain GLP-1 system is important, it's, it's clinically relevant. So what's going on in the brain? And, and what we really wanted to try to find here was whether we can dissociate the GLP-1 feeding effects from the GLP-1 nausea effects. This is a, a review that I wrote with a few colleagues of mine a, a few years ago where we, we did an overview of what's known about brain GLP-1 receptor action and, and feeding. And as you can see, there's a lot of nuclei that have been associated with GLP-1 receptor food intake reducing effects. This is all that were established at the time we wrote that review. That was a couple years ago. There's been a few more since. And as I mentioned earlier, the GLP-1 receptor is expressed throughout the brain. And what seems to be the case that in many of these GLP-1 receptor expressing brain regions, you get a reduction in food intake uh, by upregulating GLP-1 receptor action in the brain. What you see missing here is the arcuate nucleus. Uh, so again, I wanted to get back to the point that the arcuate is not everything, and in fact, uh, GLP-1 receptor activation in the arcuate is, does not produce a robust feeding effect. It does influence peripheral blood glucose regulation, but there's no, there's no feeding effects with arcuate GLP-1 receptor action. So we need to look outside of the arc to try to find the important brain regions that are key for GLP-1 receptor intake reduction and, and nausea. Which brings me back to this cartoon that I showed you earlier, which is the brain reward circuitry. And there's been a few papers from, from Matt Hayes' lab at the University of Pennsylvania here in Philadelphia, uh, Karolina Skabitska in Gothenburg, uh, showing that the mesolimbic dopamine system, the VTA and the nucleus accumbens are critical sites of action for GLP-1 receptor food reward in, in that it reduces reward-based and obesity-relevant behaviors in animals when you engage those systems in this, this dopamine pathway. It's called the mesolimbic dopamine pathway. Uh, what I'm gonna be talking about today is some data from my own lab. And we're focusing on a, a different arm of this brain reward system, one that involves the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. So when you think about the hippocampus, I know almost all of you are not neuroscientists, but you don't think about feeding behavior, you think about memory function, right? So you, you have the textbook definition of hippocampus being involved with specific types of memory. Um, that said, it is a very important brain region for feeding behavior. If you selectively lesion it in rats, they become hyperphagic and they gain body weight. Uh, normal rats can use hunger and satiety cues as discriminative stimuli for some kind of event, and rats with hippocampal lesions are insensitive to those cues. There's actually some evidence in humans as well that the hippocampus is important for feeding and for detection of hunger and satiety cues. Uh, so this is a very famous neuropsychological patient named HM. I don't know if anyone's heard of HM. Uh, HM is, is famous in neuropsychology. He had very serious epilepsy. And in the early 1950s, they did an experimental operation that removed uh, bilaterally parts of his medial temporal lobe, including his hippocampus. And that, that cured his epilepsy, but there was an unwanted side effect in that HM could no longer form new memories. He had severe anterograde amnesia. He had a memory span of about five to seven seconds. So he could, you could meet him and he seemed normal, left the room, 
come back in a few seconds later, he wouldn't remember you. Uh, he remembered everything before the surgery, but couldn't form new memories after that. And HM isn't the only individual that's had bilateral damage to the hippocampus. This has been replicated in, in many amnesic populations. And what's interesting about these individuals is that they will consume a meal, they'll consume a second meal, then they'll consume a third meal. And if you ask them how hungry they are after doing that, this is one example here from a, a study from the late 90s from Paul Rosen, University of Pennsylvania. And you can see the hunger rating here is about seven or six on a scale from zero to 10 before the first meal. It's the same after the second. It's the same after consuming the third consecutive meal. And normal people like us uh, will rate some kind of mid to high level hunger before the first meal, reject the second meal, and, and have our hunger at the lowest possible rating. So the hippocampus seems to be important, not just for remembering whether you ate, but for detecting and, and utilizing these internal hunger and satiety cues. And of course, GLP-1 receptor is expressed in the hippocampus. It's actually uh, robustly expressed there, as depicted from both transgenic mouse models that have green fluorescent protein expressed in GLP-1 receptor expressing neurons. And also, this is some data from my lab where we did fluorescent in situ hybridization, where we can use fluorescent tags to find the GLP-1 receptor. And, and of course, we find quite a bit of it in the hippocampus. So our question is, does hippocampal GLP-1 receptor feeding uh, signaling re reduce reward-based feeding? So not just free feeding in the home cage, we'll start with that, but also behaviors that are more relevant to obesity. And importantly, are these effects independent of nausea? So again, we're trying to find circuits in the brain where you can get at the food intake reducing beneficial effects of GLP-1 receptor signaling and potentially avoid the nausea-inducing effects. That is our goal. In rodents, we use uh, a standard behavioral neuropharmacological approach. So we surgically implant uh, what's called a chronic indwelling cannula. And I don't know how well you can see it, but these, these two guys here that are playing together, they actually have one surgically implanted there. And that allows us to do small volume injections in discrete brain regions in awake behaving animals to look at the effect of, of agonists or antagonists delivered directly to a brain region on their subsequent behavior. And with this approach, we're able to do very small, this is a 100 nanoliter volume is the injection that we use, and it, it's pretty well isolated to the region we're trying to target. So it doesn't just spread everywhere out through the brain. It's a very selective process. And in this case, we're injecting uh, GLP-1 analog extended 4 into the specific region of the hippocampus and examining the animal's food intake and body weight thereafter. And these are the cumulative food intake data. These animals are just sitting in the home cage, free feeding. They're not food restricted. And you can see quite a potent reduction in food intake when we activated these GLP-1 receptors in the hippocampus. About a 35% reduction 24 hours after a single injection. And this was accompanied by a reduction in their body weight as well. Next, we wanted to ask whether this is simply a, a byproduct of making the animal sick. And in this case, we used a, a different behavioral measure of, of nausea in rodents. This is one that's perhaps more common than, than the pica paradigm that I described earlier, and that's called condition flavor avoidance or condition, condition taste aversion. And when I present this procedure to undergrads and to other audiences, almost everyone has some experience with a condition taste aversion, right? So you might have had broccoli at a Chinese restaurant, and you had food poisoning, and then for some reason, even though you know broccoli's perfectly safe, uh, you couldn't eat it for a few weeks, sometimes even months, sometimes even years. A lot of people have a, a taste aversion with tequila. Anyone? <laughs> no? In rodents, this, they're very good at this kind of learning. In fact, it's a defense mechanism for them because, again, they lack the physiology for emesis. So they really need to be able to learn and be very sensitive to interoceptive consequences associated with specific flavors. And this is a common condition taste aversion or flavor avoidance paradigm in rodents where you have them uh, water restricted, they're consuming water usually. On one day you give them a novel flavor of Kool-Aid. Uh, in this example that's lemon Kool-Aid. And then they're injected with a drug or vehicle control after consuming that novel flavor. On a different day, they consume a different flavor, and they're injected with the, the vehicle treatment. Of course, we counterbalance the flavor. 
And what the animals will do is if that drug injection made them sick, made them experience nausea, they will avoid the flavor that was associated with, with that particular drug injection, which in this case was the lemon. So we had a positive control just to make sure we're doing the procedure right. Lithium chloride is, is an agent that if, if is injected in the periphery will make animals uh, very sick for about 20 minutes. And when we injected lithium chloride following one of these flavors, the animals completely avoided that flavor in a two bottle preference test. What was really cool is we didn't see a condition flavor <coughs> avoidance uh, when we injected GLP-1 receptor agonist in the ventral hippocampus. So this suggests that these intake reducing effects we observed were not secondary to nausea. And I don't have the data to show you, but we also uh, replicated that with the PICA response too. So this system does seem to be engaging the hypophagic effects of GLP-1 receptor activation while avoiding the unwanted nausea effects. Now we wanted to see whether this system is, is more relevant to obesity. Uh, in the previous study, the animals are sitting in the home cage and they're free feeding on very healthy chow. It's a, sort of the perfect food for a rat. It's not particularly palatable. They don't really like it. They eat it because they have to, but it's very healthy. Uh, but you can take them out of the home cage and put them in a more interesting environment. In this case, it's called a, an operant box, where we have animals that are pressing levers to work for food. And you can see the little pellets in the cartoon there. This is something that they like very much. So rats tend to like the same foods that we do. This is a, a fat-enriched, sucrose-enriched pellet. Uh, the equivalent would be us working for little donut holes. And they like them very much. So they're, they're not food restricted at all. You put them in the box and they will respond over 100 times in 30 minutes for these little pellets. They really like them. So we don't have to restrict them to get them to work hard for these pellets. After they learn to press the lever for the pellet, we put them on what's called a progressive ratio reinforcement schedule. So now they have to keep pressing the lever infinitely more times to get the next subsequent reinforcer. So the first reinforcer is maybe just one lever press, then it's three, then it's five, then it's nine, then it's 15. And at some point, the animal will throw in the towel and say, this isn't worth it. I really like the food, but I'm not going to press the lever 43 times to get one tiny little pellet. And that's called the break point. And when we activate these hippocampal GLP-1 receptors, we see a, a reduced uh, break point. So we get a reduction in how many times they press the lever, how many reinforcements they earn in this behavior that we think is more relevant to obesity than just free feeding in the home cage. We wanted to look at a, a different reward-based feeding behavior, and this is food impulsivity. So we know that food impulsivity is associated with obesity in, in humans, and we can ask questions about food impulsivity in this particular procedure called a differential reinforcement of low rates of responding. Uh, it's a really a terrible name for a procedure, so I'm just going to call it by the acronym DRL henceforth. And the same kind of situation, you have animals that are not food restricted, they're pressing a lever for a very palatable reinforcing pellet. At some point they're worked up to what's called a DRL 20 schedule, so now the animal has to wait 20 seconds between lever presses to get the next reinforcement. If they press the lever 18 seconds in, they don't get a pellet and that resets the clock. So this is an established method of, of looking at food impulsivity in rats, and I'll show you one in action here. So this is a well-trained rat on this DRL-20 schedule. Uh, this is sped up at 2x speed, and that green arrow was pointing to the, the lever that the animal presses. So the light went off. That means it was a reinforced press. He eats the pellet very quickly. Now he's waiting. And he screwed up. So that was about 19 and a half seconds. That would be considered an impulsive response, didn't wait the full 20 seconds, and he pouts around the cage waiting for the next opportunity to get a reinforcer. Here we are about 25 seconds, and that was reinforced. And he's about to make another impulsive response. Uh, there it is. I'm trying to remember why we were recording rats on December 30th, 2016. Apparently someone was. A uh, second and related question that we wanted to ask, specifically with this food impulsivity task, is what is the downstream signaling pathway? So in, in neuroscience, with the use of rodent models, we can not just work in one brain region isolated, but we can start to look at connections and try to find out the circuits that are important for specific behaviors. And we hypothesize that what's happening after we activate GLP-1 receptors in the hippocampus is that these neurons are engaging the medial prefrontal cortex. 
the prefrontal cortex is a brain region that's highly associated with inhibition and impulsive control. And we know that the hippocampus does actually connect to this brain region. So our approach was we had these animals trained in this impulsivity task. We upregulate GLP-1 receptors by injecting extended 4 in the hippocampus. In the same animals, we disconnected downstream communication to the prefrontal cortex by injecting a glutamate receptor antagonist in that brain region. And this is showing you the training. So this is their efficiency. This is how efficiently they're getting pellets. So if they had an impulsive response and pressed the lever that wasn't reinforced, that would reduce their efficiency. Increased efficiency would be they, they only press the lever when it's reinforced. And they do get better. They get up to about 60% efficiency. We then wanted them to be impulsive because we hypothesized that GLP-1 receptor activation in the spraying region would reduce their impulsivity. So we food restricted them. And if you look at the under vehicle conditions, they're now less efficient. So the food restriction was successful in reducing their efficiency, which again is, is suggesting they're more impulsive. They're at about 37%. Activating GLP-1 receptors in the hippocampus increased their efficiency. So this is suggesting that it reduced their impulsivity. And you can see that here. They're earning the same number of pellets, pressing the lever far fewer times. And what was also interesting is that effect was completely abolished when we disconnected that brain region from the prefrontal cortex. So we've identified this, this whole circuit here that's important for food impulsivity in that you can reduce impulsivity by activating GLP-1 receptors in the hippocampus. And the next step down is, is engaging this prefrontal cortex brain region, which is important for, again, inhibitory control and, and previously has been linked with impulsive behavior. And what's key about this, again, is that this is independent of the nausea circuitry. So this suggests that there is a possibility inside the brain of disconnecting the, the positive effects of GLP-1 analog treatment from the negative unwanted side effects. The last thing I'm going to talk about briefly is, is there a potential clinical relevance? So unfortunately, we can't take obese individuals and inject analogs directly into specific brain regions. We're clearly not there yet and probably never will be. But there is potential at some point in the future to use methods like RNA interference, for example, to permanently alter gene expression. So RNA interference is an endogenous process that happens in neurons. You have small RNA molecules, uh, small interfering RNA or short hairpin RNA or microRNAs that interfere with messenger RNA to influence gene expression. And in the past few years, through advances in, in viral-based approaches and genetic approaches and animal models, we can package these short hairpin RNAs to specifically target a gene inside viral vectors. And the virus that is most commonly used is the adeno-associated virus, or AAV. And in this case, we have an AAV that has short hairpin RNAs targeting the GLP-1 receptor uh, specifically. What we can then do is inject these AAVs into specific brain regions. Uh, this AAV has a transgene expressed, so not only is it reducing the expression of the GLP-1 receptor, but it's also causing these neurons to express a, a green fluorescent protein. So now these neurons are glowing, so we can know which ones are infected and know whether we've targeted the right brain region. And when we do gene analyses, in that brain region, with this particular AAV, we see a reduction in the GLP-1 receptor expression by about 50%. And this is, for the most part, considered to be a permanent reduction. So there's no recovery of this function. This hasn't been tested throughout the entire life of the animal, but we know that several months later, which is a long time in a, in a rodent's lifespan, uh, you still see the reduction or increase in gene expression depending upon which short hairpin RNAs were targeted. So we used this approach, and we targeted that same population of, of neurons that we use for the pharmacology studies, the GLP-1 receptor neurons in the hippocampus. And when we had this 50% knockdown of GLP-1 receptor in the brain region, we saw no effect on their body weight and food intake, uh, which is somewhat disappointing, but not really, because again, this is not an obesity model. These animals are just sitting in the home cage eating healthy food. But when we took them out of the home cage and had them working for this very palatable donut hole, if you will, we saw a very potent difference between the, the two groups. So we have two control groups there. One has a, a scrambled 
virus, which is not targeting any specific gene sequence. Then we have a non-injected control. And then in the animals that had the 50% reduction in GLP-1 receptor activation, specifically in that brain region, they're showing a, a very strong response in, in trying to work for these pellets. So they're pressing the lever about twice as many times as a normal animal in the same session. So back to the clinical relevance, what if we could design AAVs using RNA interference to knock up GLP-1 receptor expression, for example, which can be done in brain regions like the hippocampus where you get a reduction in food intake without the concomitant nausea. Um, by the way, the hippocampus is not the only brain region that has been shown to have feeding effects independent of nausea. The, the ventral tegmental area and nucleus accumbens have also been linked with feeding independent of nausea in the brain. Or alternatively, we could design an AAV using RNA interference to knock down GLP-1 uh, receptor expression in regions that might specifically mediate the nausea effects. And we don't know a lot about what those regions might be, uh, but one region has been identified, the central nucleus of the amygdala, where you, if you administer a GLP-1 directly to that brain region, you get uh, conditioned taste aversion, but you have no reduction in food intake. So you could imagine if you use GLP-1 analogs for treatment, but you had an individual who had a specific virus targeted to the central nucleus of the amygdala, for example, to tune down the GLP-1 receptor expression in that brain region, we could potentially improve GLP-1 analog uh, therapies in the future. And this might sound like science fiction. Um, don't think we're ready to start injecting viruses into the brains of, of our patients. Uh, but that said, it is possible, right? So we are using RNA interference to potentially divine clini uh, design clinical therapies for cancer and Parkinson's disease. So this is actually being used, uh, not using AAVs yet. Uh, but that said, AAVs are, are very safe uh, they're not replicating the very low pathogenicity. So this is maybe science fiction, but maybe at some point RNA interference could be used to just target specific populations of, of receptors in the brain. And I'll, I'll end there. I uh, appreciate everyone showing up this morning. Thank you. This has been a Dana Miller Video Network presentation.